It is my uh, great honor and pleasure to uh, introduce to you our keynote, today's uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Tom Sudolf, which again does not require too much introduction, but we have to do this for you. Uh, um, Tom was born in Göttingen in 1955 and obtained his MD. <laughs> This is from this is from his uh, Nobel um, Prize page. I actually have a date, so you guys can send him birthday um, wishes if you guys want to know about that. Anyway, so he obtained his MD and doctor degrees from University of Göttingen in 1982, and worked with um, uh, Dr. Victor Wigtaker on the biophysical structure of sectary granules, and he's, um, he did his internship at the University of Göttingen Hospital. After that, he moved to the U.S. and worked with doctors uh, Mike Brown and Joe Goldenstein at UT Southwestern um, in Dallas and um, uh, studied the structure, expression, and cholesterol-dependent regulation of the LDL receptor genes. And he then um, moved, served on the faculty um, on the uh, faculty uh, position at UT Southwestern in Dallas until 2008. After that, he moved to Stanford in 2008. Um, so as you may all know that um, he's, um, Dr. Sudolf is um, primarily interested in the molecular mechanisms underlying synaptic transmission, including synaptic formation and function. His major contribution now is uh, textbook, textbook knowledge of um, how um, understanding calcium-dependent synaptic transmission, the, uh, vesicle, um, the synaptic vesicle component and the scenario complex, how that might inf uh, uh, involved um, in uh, calcium-dependent release, and also the components that um, um, also, st um, the uh, presynaptic scaffold component that um, uh, presumably underlie the modulation um, for short-term and long-term plasticity at the presynaptic site. And recent years, he has moved his research interest in a relatively new direction, is to understand the uh, family of protein, uh, transmembrane protein um, neurorexin and its ligand, how that might uh, specify uh, synaptic specificity, and then to, um, uh, for the uh, synaptic formation and the microcircuit um, formation in the, in the, in the brain. That, um, and many of his, um, the genes of interest is implicated in autism. And also, um, so, and also um, the earlier work also involved in some candidate genes in uh, neurodegeneration. Um, so um, I'd have to say that, um, so he has been um, decorated with many uh, awards, including, um, just to mention a few, the um, uh, Bristol Meyer Award in Neuroscience, the Passano Award, the Cal, Cal Calvary Award in Neuroscience in 2010, the Lascar de Baker Medical uh, Basic Research Award in 2013, and the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2013. Um, he has been a uh, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, investigator since 1986, and was the director of the Department of Neuroscience in Dallas, and uh, has been a chaired professor at Stanford. And just as a personal note, uh, it uh, has always been a uh, pleasure to listen to Tom's talk, um, his uh, poetic portrait of his scientific adventure, uh, of his um, research topic, and also um, a topic that um, dear to my heart and possibly also dear to everybody in this audience. Uh, it reminds me how, uh, what, uh, why we do what we do, uh, the uh, beauty, the motivation, and the intellectual uh, depths that we can go through uh, into the unknown territory of understanding human mind and brain function. With that, um, please join me to welcome Dr. Sudolf. Thank you. Uh, the date is December 22nd, and I do, <laughs> I do accept gifts. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's an honor for me to be here today. I would like to thank Wei Feng and everybody else for having me. It is a little bit uh, often uh, uh, almost like a a nostalgic event for me because I actually was invited for the keynote of a PICOA exactly 11 years ago. Uh, 
2004. I don't know if Susumu remembers. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I still remember that that was a wonderful symposium, as is this one. I've learned a tremendous amount, and it's somewhat uh, you know, humbling to have to give you this lecture. I hope that at the end of it, uh, you will feel the same way that Wei Feng felt before it. <laughs> but there's nothing I can do about it. So there is no need here to introduce neural circuits because much has been said better than I could ever say it. The way how I look at neural circuits is emphasizing synapses because circuits are formed by synapses. And synapses are the basic computational units of the brain. People often consider circuits in terms of only their synaptic connectivity, which is obviously central to how they're constructed. But the parameters of the synapses that construct them, as, that make them, that create the connectivity are just as important as the connectivity itself because in a circuit, those parameters really determine the input-output relationships. What I want to do is give you one example that I found kind of interesting, and I hope you will understand why I find it interesting, and that's an example that utilizes sphere conditioning as a memory task. The way how we applied this assay is a little different from general ways of applying this assay in that in addition to having, after the training and contextual fear conditioning test, we then put the mice into an altered context to measure in some very crude way, not very sophisticated, no way close to what Susumu is doing, for example, the precision of the memory of how well the mouse actually remembers the precise context. And thereafter, we apply the tone for the acute fear conditioning. Some years ago, we tested whether activity, synaptic activity in the prefrontal cortex would be required for this. In the experimental paradigm shown here, we injected the mice and waited a month and then trained them and then tested the mice. And we found, as is in agreement with a huge amount of literature over the years, that for this type of test, the prefrontal cortex is absolutely inessential for contextual fear conditioning. But what surprised us that in the altered context, using two different manipulations, tetanus toxin, which blocks all synaptic transmission and synaptic tagment one, knocked down, by the way, that's the only time I'm going to mention synaptic tagment today. But it has been a pleasure to work on it for 30 years. And I can only recommend it, OK? So, <laughs> Anyway, um, so what happens is that these mice basically don't recognize, really, that the context is different. They think it's the same context. Their memory is not as exact as precise. And that interested us because we were wondering how is it possible that the prefrontal cortex influences this hippocampal dependent immediate memory, if I can call this immediate after a day or two, to a context. And so we were looking for potential pathways that may mediate this event. And in order to do that, we mapped the projections from the prefrontal cortex using a, a technique that labels presynaptic terminals, which we call synaptic tag. And we found the usual projection targets, including the striatum that Bernardo discussed so eloquently. But we also identified strong projections to a completely obscure, at least for me, obscure nucleus in the middle, just below the thalamus, nucleus reunions. When we inactivated a number of targets of the prefrontal cortex using tetanus toxin, it had no effect whatsoever on fear conditioning, except for inactivation of the nucleus reunions. And in these experiments, we both inactivated synaptic transmission out of the nucleus reunions 
using tetanus toxin. And we activated the spontaneous activity of these neurons by knockdown of neuroligand 2, which increases spontaneous activity by decreasing inhibition. And what we found is that in this case, again, contextual fear conditioning was unchanged. But that in the altered context, blocking the output replicated blocking synaptic transmission in the prefrontal cortex in that the mice didn't recognize that the context was different. Whereas, if we activated this nuance, we found the opposite, that the mouse thought that there was no similarity whatsoever in this analysis. And we can compute these numbers as a discrimination index to sort of make it easier to understand that here they discriminate less, here they discriminate, uh, here they discriminate more, here they discriminate less, uh, to explain how this works. And uh, tone conditioning, cute tone conditioning was fine. So these experiments seem to suggest, possibly, that the nucleus reunions is an output pathway for the prefrontal cortex. And indeed, the nucleus reunions then projects back to the hippocampus. And that it sort of enables the hippocampus to set the memory exactly right. Moreover, it suggests the possibility that maybe just activity in this nucleus reunions was what made it do this. In other words, that if it's more active or less active, it has to be sort of in a balance between the two. And um, so we asked whether the nucleus reunions controls memory precision by a general activity level or via a specific spike firing pattern. And to, to ask this question, and this is really the critical experiment I wanted to discuss here while I'm doing this introduction, was to basically use optogenetics, express channel rhodopsin, and then apply two different stimulus patterns. One of them involves a 4 hertz tonic stimulation. The other one, a 15 hertz, 30 hertz phasic stimulation. During the training, and afterwards do the usual measurements of contextual and contextual field conditioning. And surprisingly, what we find is that the two patterns of excitation of these neurons during the training had opposite effects on fear memory precision. Again, contextual fear conditioning was normal. But in the altered context, the phasic tended to make the mice think that it is in, still in the same context, whereas the tonic had the opposite effect. And when you compute this as the discrimination index, it, it becomes more clear that these different patterns, not the activity level itself, but the pattern of activity, was crucial. What this means to us is that the nucleus reunion spike pattern controls fear memory precision. It doesn't really explain how the nucleus reunions works. I have no idea. At least I can remember now the name of that thing. Um, <laughs> but um, the only way how we can explain this, I think, is by thinking about how synapses transduce spike patterns. And the fact is, as Troy, for example, illustrated, uh, uh, talked about, is that when you excite nerve terminals with different patterns, you get completely different responses in terms of the output, depending on what the properties of the synapses are. Some facilitate, some depress. There's all kinds of responses can be. And as a result, you can't really predict what the postsynaptic neurons to a presynaptic neuron that's being stimulated, what the response in that neuron will be. And if we really want to understand, for example, why different patterns of excitation of these nucleus reunions pattern have different effects, presumably, on the postsynaptic hippocampal target cells, we would have to actually measure these postsynaptic responses. In other words, just defining neuronal connections and elucidating the requirement for a given class of neurons, the circuit, for a behavior does not actually explain that behavior. It doesn't tell us how it works. It only tells us that somehow this is important. And so with this in mind, what I want to talk about today 
in my presentation to you is first very briefly uh, talk about the, what I call the human genetics revolution, the enormous advances in the genetics of uh, neuropsychiatric diseases, in particular autism. Um, and then I want to talk about our experiments trying to develop complementary experimental approaches to the biology of autism. And since it's me who's talking about this, it would be the synaptic biology, of course, of autism. Okay. So let me start with the beginning. A few weeks ago, this article was published in The Guardian, which is basically an article that complains how stupid we scientists are, because we've spent one billion on autism, and the tangible benefits are elusive. There's none. And I often encounter this kind of sentiment. And I think it's very important for us to deal with this. Because it basically suggests that we, as the research community, have failed. In other words, that we should get an award for a spectacular failure. I guess that's the award I should have gotten, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so I obviously don't think that's quite fair. But I, don't, I do think that we have to put everything in perspective. And we have failed, basically, to uh, communicate the magnitude of the challenge. And what is important here is actually very important also for trying to understand the function of genes in synapses, in the brain, in autism, whatever. Because in a very abstract level, if you consider the size of the brain, the number of neurons, the number of synapses, the number of circuits, of which there's going to be millions, because many neurons participate in multiple circuits at the same time, and you compare that with the number of genes, there is such a disparity, there is no question that no gene will ever do one thing, and that you can just linearly sort of relay genes to function. It's always going to be multiple things at the same time. And I will try to give you some examples of that. So after spending a lot of money on cancer, <laughs> why, why would you expect to understand brain disorders for only one billion? Now, I'd be happy if I had one billion. In fact, I'd be happy if I had one million. But um, for research as a as a general um, endeavor, that is obviously not going to be enough. As alluded to a minute ago, one area of enormous progress, however, especially on autism, has been human genetics. And there have been innumerable papers describing gene mutations, deletions, point mutations that I won't discuss other people can discuss much more expertly. I just want to cite as an example for the amount of progress that has been made, but also the limitations of this progress inherent in the approach. Using this particular paper, which is one of the most recent papers that has been published from Matt State's lab, co-authored by almost everybody in that field. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, that further defines the genomic architecture of, uh, of ASD, of autism spectrum disorders. And uh, I found this paper incredibly useful because it really further down gets to sort of the meat of the thing, namely the discovery that in autism there are likely many different genes with many different pathways involved. <laughs> What biological insights can we get from these gene lists? And so this is where the limitations of this approach is. And papers normally provide these types of network analyses, as shown here, which was from this particular uh, paper. And I just want to focus in on this particular area of this network analysis, because part of it is dear to my heart. In the middle of it is neurexin 1 and neuroligin, which I'll talk about, which is a transsynaptic set adhesion complex. But as you can see, connected to this by these lines are, for example, a transcription factor that I have no idea how it is connected, or the actin cytoskeleton. So this 
basically what this illustrates is, yes, there are genes, but actually we don't know the biology. We don't understand the biology. The gene lists are a huge step forward, but the current understanding of the biology of these genes is too limited to allow biological conclusions. I think that that's just something we have to acknowledge. And, um, and we really need to basically try to communicate that we can't expect to jump from genes to understanding. We actually need to understand first what the genes do before we can actually gain insight into why mutations might be um, pathogenic. So in my talk today, I try to illustrate the beginnings of such an analysis focusing on the neuroligan neuroaxon complex, which leads me to the actual data part of my talk. So let me first introduce you to the neuroaxons and their ligands, including neuroligans. There may be some people here who have not heard of them, although I doubt that. Um, and all of this started actually many years ago when we studied toxins made by this beautiful, gorgeous <laughs> female. And um, this is a black widow spider. The black widow spider produces alpha lactotoxin that binds to presynaptic receptors to trigger massive neurotransmitter release. And neurexins were identified actually more than 25 years ago, in 92, as these presynaptic receptors. Neurexins are presynaptic cell adhesion molecules that have typical domain structure of cell adhesion molecules. They come in two flavors, alpha neurexins and beta neurexins. They have composed alpha neurexins of alanestamines intersp with interspersed EGF-like repeats. Beta neurexins have only the last of the six alanestamines of alpha neurexins and a unique N terminus, uh, but are otherwise the same as alpha neurexins. There's three genes that have the same domain organization. There's an enormous degree of alternative splicing of neurexins at six canonical sites with thousands of isoforms. And there have been many, many mutations in autism and schizophrenia and other neuropsychiatric disorders. When we first cloned neurexins, the alternative splicing at that point was very exciting because it wasn't known, as we know now, that most transcript alternative is spliced. In fact, if it had been known then, probably our paper wouldn't have been published, but anyway. Uh, so as it turns out, alternative splicing is probably an important biological mechanism. But for most cases, we don't know really whether it is significant or even regulated. In a recent study, we analyzed this at the single cell level using quantitative single cell PCR with connected to fluid ion analyses in these experiments. And for example, we analyzed the striatum, which we already heard about, in addition to the hippocampus. What you see here in this one example is the hippocampus, where we labeled PV-containing neurons with TD tomato genetically and then aspirated cytosol from these two different types of interneurons and then analyzed these by RT-PCR. And they have the expected le markers for either PV neurons or CCK neurons. And then we studied the expression of neurexins and of their splice variants. You cannot do this with RNA-seq because your coverage in RNA-seq will never be good enough for a molecule, and we can argue about this. Maybe some of you are convinced that that's wrong. But anyway, in our experience, it's never good enough to actually have the coverage that allows you really to analyze alternative splicing at multiple sites. What's interesting is that the expression levels of neurexins are different already. This is just neurexin 1 alpha and 1 beta between the two cells. And that alternative splicing of neurexin 1 is highly regulated at splice sites 2, 3, 4, and 5 five that were analyzed here in a manner that differs between the two cells, two different types of interneurons. And these experiments confirmed that there is a kind of code in the neurexin alternative splicing that is cell type specific in the sense that you can take the pattern of alternative splicing of neurexins and can predict what type of cell it is. So the alternative splicing of neurexins is at least regulated 
When you look at the structure of new axons, it seems obvious that there should be postsynaptic ligands. And indeed, studies over the last 20 years have identified a large number of such postsynaptic ligands. This slide here shows just a small section, small number, subset of these <laughs> ligands that have been described. These include cell balance that were discovered by Machiner's lab very recently to bind with nanomolar affinity to new axons. Neural ligands were actually the first ligands described that bind to new axons, LRTMs, cell latrophilins, which are cell adhesion GPCRs. What's interesting is that all of these ligands bind to both alpha and beta neuroaxons, and they all bind with nanomolar affinity, but they have nothing else in common. There is no motif that you could sort of tease out and that would be a neuroaxon binding motif. They often compete with each other. What is also interesting is that all of these ligands that I show here are regulated by alternative splicing in their interaction with neuroaxons. In this particular splice site, splice site number four, in the sense that, for example, new cell balance only bind when the splice site number four is inserted, whereas LRTMs only bind in our hands when splice site number four is excluded. And new ligands depend, bind depending on the new ligand isoform, new ligand alternative splicing, and new exon isoform, so it it's, it's, uh, depends on the precise molecules. So these ligands thus form in some way an illustration of how many things monoaxons might potentially do. However, these ligands themselves also bind to many other things as well. So this almost creates like a network, a molecular network, a molecular circuit. We love circuits, right? Yeah. Of all of these ligands, arguably, neuroligands may be the most important because they're evolutionarily conserved. They have a simple domain structure with a homodimer and an esterase homology domain that's catalytically inactive. There are four genes encoding proteins with diverse properties and localizations. And again, your ligand mutations have been linked to autism in a major way. So much for the introduction for neurexins and the ligands. In the next section of my talk, I would like to discuss the one question that's most closest to trying to get at autism, which is, what does a mutation actually do in a human neuron? What's interesting about neuroaxon 1 is that many mutations have been identified, both in schizophrenia and autism. To the best of my knowledge, because the new gene is so large and subject to CNVs, it's still the most common single gene mutation in autism. What you see here is an overview of some of the deletions that have been mapped based on the USCS, USCS genome browser. And you can see they basically cover the whole gene. It goes from here to here. And some mutations affect both alpha and beta neurexins, others only alpha neurexins. Virtually all of these mutations are associated with some degree of neuropsychiatric abnormality. But the same mutation can be associated, apparently, with autism or schizophrenia or intellectual disability. So the mutations themselves, although they predispose to a high, with a high degree of penetrance, do not actually specify the disorder, which I think is important. Because if you think about this, it means that most likely there are genetic background effects and poss possibly developmental effects, environmental effects, that in addition to the genetic predisposition contribute to the development of the disorder. To explore the synaptic significance of neurexin 1 mutations, we generated additional mutations of neurexin 1 in ES cells. And we produ produced two different types of mutation, a conditional knockout and a conditional truncation. We chose this approach as opposed to using IPS cells from patients because of the background question. In this approach, we can make neurons that we can differentiate from these ES cells that are precisely identical in every respect, especially in terms of genetic background, but also in terms of clonal variability, except for the conditional mutation. 
And that gives us the control beyond, uh, it doesn't give us the patient's uh, genome, but it gives us control of the actual precise and low, sort of isolated effect of the mutation. The conditional knockout approach is a very traditional one copied from what we do in mice. The conditional truncation approach was meant to both label Nurexin with an HNA epitope, which worked beautifully, and also to make it conditionally truncated and secreted, which didn't work because the truncated allele produced a protein that was immediately degraded. And so there was, this was, in the mutant case, effectively the same as the knockout. However, these two different mutations allowed us to control the results because they're controlled for each other. They're completely different mutations, and their phenotypes, as it turns out, and as I will tell you, was exactly the same. We make neurons from these using a protocol that we developed some years ago, which allows rapid generation of neurons, which we often refer to as IN cells, as induced neurons, from ES or IPS cells using a single transcription factor this produces, within a few weeks, less than two weeks, in fact, neurons that are homogeneous, excitatory, forebrain neurons, um, which are fully active to form synapses and um, have all the properties of reasonably normal neurons. Um, and so using this protocol, we then analyzed the effect of the mutation, neurex mutation, first on the development of the neurons and then on synaptic transmission. <coughs> we found that there was no effect, no measurable effect on the development of the neurons or on synapse density. The heterozygous mutations, all these are heterozygous mutations, caused about a 50% decrease, this is a logarithmic scale, 50% decrease in the levels of mRNA, as you would expect. So it works, it's a, high, it's a haploinsufficiency, it's, it's not a knockout. And we wondered then, obviously, well, what about synaptic transmission? And it turns out that even though it's only a 50% decrease, the profound effect, effects on synaptic transmission are profound. They're amazing. It's surprising to me, especially since in parallel in mice, haploinsufficiency does not produce the same effects. So this is a human phenotype. And what you see here is that the mini rate, for example, goes down about approximately 50%. The amplitude remains the same. If you look at synaptic strength using evoked responses, you get about a 40% decrease. Again, this was reproduced with independent clones and independent mutations. It's exactly the same in all of them. And most interestingly, when we use stimulus trains in these ion cells, <coughs> we found that the initial response was highly abnormal, as it was for isolated action potentials. It had to be, right? But that when you go on in the train, it normalizes. And this is the absolute scale. It becomes the same. So it's only the initial release probability during the train. And when you plot this in the standard Y as a normalized response, it looks like facilitation. But this is I really what I think is the most important thing which basically means this is not a general decrease in release probability as such that happens here. What happens here is that this is the defect, the impairment, is really limited to the initial release probability that manifests either during a single action potential or in the beginning of bursts or trains. So what these experiments, I think, demonstrated is that neurexin mutations do have a functional effect. They are somehow, they are likely to be pathogenic because they profoundly alter synaptic transmission. But some, probably not stupid, but anyway, annoying reviewer, okay, <laughs> uh, when we send in this paper, felt that, well, the IN cell technology and so on, that's really no good. Um, because God knows what kinds of neurons you make and how can you make neurons within a week or two, and that can't be possible, and you should do everything with neurons that are produced in the classical standard way. So poor Chang He and Ying Sha had to go back and do everything again using a classical Rosette uh, intermediate 
generation of, uh, of neurons, making neurons. And the gene expression profiling of these neurons, as opposed to the answers, actually revealed that they're incredibly similar in terms of the genes that are expressed, with one exception. The classical method produces both excited or inhibitor neurons. They're more heterogeneous. Whereas our ion cells, when we use NGN2, that is to say, produce only excited neurons and no inhibitor neurons. But otherwise, it was very, very, very similar. And gratifyingly, their synaptic phenotype was also the same. They had no change in intrinsic electrical properties, 50% decrease in evoked release, and the same phenotype of in terms of the stimulus trains, it normalizes at the end of the train and looks like facilitation. In fact, the phenotype is even bigger. Mm -hmm. So these experiments, I believe, validate the association of neurexin-1 mutations with autism and schizophrenia as a candidate or whatever pathogenic uh, change. And they also confirm the utility of our end cells, which are a hell of a lot easier to use than the traditional ways. Um, however, there's enormous limitations to this approach in order to understand what genes do. And these limitations are independent of what methods you use to make neurons. Because the diversity of brain, the normal construction of a brain with glia, and the generation of circuits in a developmentally highly regulated manner can never be reproduced in a dish. And so I think that in order to understand the effect of mutations, we obviously have to do analyses such as I described here. But we also have to use mice as an approach. And so for the remainder of the talk, I'll do exactly that. I'll talk about mice. I'll tell you about complementary studies that we have performed on mice. And I'll tell you about complementary studies now on neurexin 3 because of neurexin 1 simply because we don't have sufficient data for neurexin 1. We are way behind with neurexin 1. We have only data of neurexin 3. That sort of illustrate beyond what I showed you for the human neurons, that these molecules are almost like functional scaffolds that do many different things in a circuit-dependent manner. And, um, and, that, um, and I hope that that will uh, convince you that we need to really try to relate mutations specifically to various involvements of neurexins. And I hope that will become even clearer when I discuss in my final data part the neural ligand mutations. So the starting point of our analysis of the neurexin-3 mutation, neurexin-3 functions, was the conditional knockout that ablates all neurexin-3 transcripts, alphas and betas, everything. And when we analyze this in cultured neurons, in my, so when we do constitutive knockouts of neurexin-3 alpha beta, most of the mice die. So um, this is why we analyze conditional mice. So when we analyzed this in culture, we found a very unexpected phenotype in hippocampal cultured neurons. And this phenotype is illustrated in this slide, in that there was a selective impairment of evoked AMPA receptor mediated APSCs, but not NMDA receptor mediated APSCs and not IPSCs. There was also a decrease in mini frequency and a mini amplitude. Taken together, this suggested a classical postsynaptic phenotype of a loss of postsynaptic AMPA receptor levels. And so we measured postsynaptic AMPA receptor levels using cultured neurons, again, surface staining of glutamate receptors, as shown uh, illustrated here in the uh, control and in the knockout. And what you can see here is that the puncture density is unchanged, synapse density is unchanged, no big surprise. But the size of the puncture as a proxy for the amount of AMPA receptors is decreased approximately 50%. There's also a trend, but no statistical significance, of the PSD95 staining, whereas presynaptic VGLUT1 staining was unchanged. The signal intensity for AMPA receptors was unchanged. And the levels of AMPA receptors total were unchanged. These and corollary experiments indicated that AMPA receptors, and in fact the same is true for GLUA2, 
are decreased on the surface. And it turns out they are decreased at least in part because there is increased amperoceptor endocytosis. This uses a typical two-stage feeding assay with antibodies that I believe, I don't know whether Rick developed this first or Rob or, or Roger. Uh, anyway, um, and that allows you to measure endocytosis, and you can see that endocytosis is dramatically enhanced. So these experiments suggested that for some, for unexpectedly in hippocampal culture neurons, neuroxin 3 alpha beta is essential for postsynaptic amperoceptor maintenance. We wondered whether this is a functional phenotype and whether this could be rescued by all neurexins. And so we rescued this in cultured neurons. I'm only going to okay. show you rescue experiment with neurexin 3, but the same new rescues could be observed for 1 and 2. They were redundant. And in these rescue experiments, we found that both 3 alpha and 3 beta rescued only if they were splicited S4 minus, but not if they were splicited S4 plus, as measured here in the amplitude of evoked amper response, amper receptor mediated EPSCs. So it's clearly a functional or a developmental phenotype that requires neurexin 3 in an SS4 minus form. Now, since SS4 minus is extracellular, we wondered whether SS4 minus neurexin 3 does this by a purely extracellular mechanism. And so we tested the ability of neurexin 3 that has no transmembrane region and no intercellular sequence after all to rescue this. And when we did this, we analyzed GPI anchored neurexin 3, so it's attached to the surface of the neuron, but it doesn't, but attached by a lipid anchor, and it fully rescued. However, if you took secreted neurexin 3 that is encoded by a normal splice variant of neurexin 3 and that in our hands is fully secreted, it didn't rescue. In other words, the phenotype dependent on the display of surface anchored neurexin 3 was an SS4 minus but it didn't need any intercellular signal transduction. Does the exclusive rescue of this phenotype that is splice at 4 dependent mean that the amper receptor related function of neurexin 3 is regulated by total splicing at splice at number 3? So for us, for me personally, that was actually a very important question because I've always been fascinated by neurexin 3 alternative splicing, but with the discovery that virtually everything is alternatively spliced Garden, we really had no evidence that that means anything. And so we went after this question using a genetic approach because in every rescue experiment, no matter how you do it, there's always overexpression. And overexpression is always a problem. So, and it's a particular problem with something like neurexins where there's thousands of splice variants. So we used a genetic approach by introducing into the neurexin gene a point mutation that renders the axon that is alternatively spliced in splice head number four, constitutively inserted. And this is done by changing a non-canonical splice acceptor sequence to a canonical splice acceptor sequence. In addition, we flanked the same axon by LOX P sites, so we could just remove it and con constitutively turn this into an SS4 minus. And this worked beautifully. The control, which is the knock in SS4 plus, is always SS4 plus. And pre recombinant makes this into always SS4 minus. And so this allows us control over just one splice site in this whole neurexin gene without changes in expression, without changes in the other splice sites at the same time. And when we did this experiment, analyzed these cultures, these neur uh, the neurons from these mice in culture, we found exactly the same phenotype as the 3 alpha beta <coughs> knockout in hippocampal neurons. And so in these experiments, we analyzed, we compared wild type, unrelated wild type with the SS4 plus and SS4 minus in green. And you can see the SS4 plus has the same phenotype as this 3 alpha beta knockout. The SS4 minus has no phenotype compared to the wild type. And this is selective for amper receptor mediated as opposed to NMDA receptor and mediated EPSCs and IPSCs. Neurexin 3 SS4 plus is rescued by all SS4 minus neurexins, just like the S to neurexin 3 alpha beta knockout phenotype. Um, and just to round this up, they had the same effect 
on the surface display of glue A1 and glue A2. It's decreased in the SS4 plus and reversed in the SS4 minus back to wild type levels. And this is shown just in cumulative plots here again. Furthermore, the mechanism turned out to be the same. And the plus isoflocin also destabilizes post-synaptic amplitude receptors. So basically, all of the phenotype of the Nurexin 3 alpha beta knockout in hippocampal, cultured hippocampal neurons was reproduced just by this one small change in alternative splicing. What troubled us we, is that this is a pro, purely postsynaptic phenotype. And as you know, we and others, well, not everybody, I've always somebody who disagrees, but anyway, have always thought that neurexins are presynaptic. And so um, we were troubled by the fact that this is really a postsynaptic phenotype because it suggested that this is a transsynaptic effect. And so we wanted to test this. And in order to test this, we used an approach that we like, which is we injected Cre recombinase into AAVs, including Cre recombinase or control into the CA1 region of mice at P21. Then we cut slices at P35, and we measure synaptic transmission in subiculum neurons after stimulation by CA1 axons here. And in this manner, the subiculum neurons that are recorded from postsynaptically have never seen Cre. It's only presynaptic. So this preparation allows you a perfect control of presynaptic effects. And what we saw when we did this for the Nurexin 3 alpha beta knockout is that in the two principal types of pyramidal neurons in the subiculum, which are called burst firing and regular firing neurons, as you see here, there was a similar decrease in synaptic strength in responses mediated by amper receptors. If anything, it was stronger in regular firing neurons than in burst firing neurons. The same phenotype was observed for the SS4 plus mice. And I won't go through this in the details, basically the same. And it shows that A, the phenotype is actually operant in vivo. These are CA1 neurons. You get a loss of amper receptor responses, and MDA receptor responses seem to be fine. And B, the burst that, um, uh, that um, it's a presynaptic phenotype. It must be presynaptic because the postsynaptic was never manipulated in any of these. So it is truly presynaptic. It's a transsynaptic effect. It's not a postsynaptic neurexin. The neurexin truly is presynaptic. And so it must be a transsynaptic effect. Now, interestingly, also sort of linking up to Richard Moore's beautiful discussion of, of synaptic tagging, um, it turns out that this transsynaptic interaction is also related to LTP. In subiculum neurons, the two different types of neurons have different types of LTP. The regular firing neurons have NMDA receptor-dependent LTP, and the burst firing neurons have presynaptic type of LTP, which is in itself quite interesting. And so we wondered, since especially the NMDA receptor-dependent LTP is amper receptor-dependent, and this is an amper receptor phenotype, whether this manipulation would lead to a change in presynaptic LTP. And indeed, it does. Neurexin 3 SS4 plus neurons have no, virtually no LTP whatsoever. Very, very little. Postsynaptic LTP. And this is done in subiculum preparation with only presynaptic manipulation of Neurexin 3. And you can fully rescue this by excising SS4 plus presynaptically. There's no change in PET pulse facilitation. And as it turns out, the presynaptic type of LTP, even though it's a presynaptic manipulation, is perfectly normal. So what this indicates is that presynaptic neurexins control postsynaptic amper receptors in hippocampal neurons by a transsynaptic interaction in a manner that required SS4 splicite out. And so how does this work? And the obvious answer would be, that there must be a transsynaptic interaction. And indeed, although we are not certain that this is the ligand that's involved, when we studied the postsynaptic concentration of one of the ligands that depends on SS4 minus completely, which is LRTM, we found that there was a decrease in the mutant that was highly significant. There was also a decrease in neuroligands, one, but much, much less so. It was not significant 
and here's the cumulative plot of the same observation. So what this indicated to us that most likely, although not conclusively, presynaptic neurexins act by binding to postsynaptic LRTMs, especially since in an independent study, Rob and I had found that LRTM is actually essential for NMDA receptor mediated RTP in the hippocampus. And so that seemed to fit quite nicely together. So the conclusions thus far is that presynaptic neurexin 3, SS4 minus but not SS4, maintains postsynaptic amper receptors, that the extracellular neurexin sequences are sufficient to mediate this effect, that this is totally dependent on alternative splicing, so the alternative splicing is a gate, and this alternative splicing is a gate for postsynaptic LTP. So I don't know how that fits in with all the postsynaptic regulation of LTP and synaptic tagging and so on, because this case, the presynaptic alternative splicing of neurexins, which has been shown by others, especially Peter Scheifele, to be plastic, to be changeable, to be regulated, also by signaling, regulates the postsynaptic ability to actually undergo LTP. Is this the universal function of neurexin 3 alpha beta? Is what neurexin 3 does is basically mediated by splice state number 4 doing this kind of stuff? Well, obviously it isn't. And um, one hint to that came from studies that were performed in olfactory bulb neurons. We love to analyze the olfactory bulb because it can be easily manipulated both in vitro and in vivo. And when you culture it, you can see mitral cells. They're huge and granular cells that are numerous, and they form synapses in culture. And you can analyze them. And when we analyze them from the neurexin 3 alpha beta knockout, they had a completely different phenotype. Normal app EPSCs, ample receptor and NMDA receptor EPSCs, a loss of IPSCs, that is the granule cell synapses onto the mitral cells. This phenotype was caused by a decrease in presynaptic release probability, totally different cause of the phenotype. It was all independent of splice set number four because the splice set number four, SS4 plus and SS4 minus, had the same responses. They had SS4 plus had no phenotype in this preparation. So it suggests that a different ligand interaction mechanism mediates the release phenotype in this. And indeed, when we used rescue experiments, we found that full length neurexin 3 alpha SS number 4 could, 4 plus could fully rescue the phenotype. In fact, overexpression seemed to overshoot, increase the release of IP, the increase the amplitude of IPCs, suggesting that it's fully active, different from what I showed you before. Moreover, GPI anchored neurexin could not rescue. So you do need the intracellular sequence. We have completely different mechanisms. Finally, is this relevant in vivo? To test this, we used again stereotactic injections into mice. We found that when we inactivated neurexin 3 alpha beta in the olfactory bulb bilaterally in mice, the mice had a phenotype in the food finding assay. I love this assay because you have to look for for cookies, I wish they were looking for chocolate. I would prefer that, but um, <laughs> can't have everything. Um, and, um, and you can see that they just take much longer to actually find the cookie, meaning they can't smell as much. And when we cut slices, we see the same phenotype, an a decrease in the input-output curve of IPSCs. So neurexin 3 conclusions. In addition to the four conclusions that I already mentioned, which establish a transsynaptic signaling by presynaptic neurexin extracellular domain via binding to a splicing for dependent postsynaptic ligand as a mechanism for regulating postsynaptic amper receptors. There's another function in these particular cells, which are the mitral neurons, are the granular cell neurons, in uh, regulating or maintaining presynaptic, normal presynaptic release probability of, of GABA. Um, and, um, and which requires actually a cell autonomous function that is mere, involves its transmembrane regions and or intercellular sequences. So neurexin 3 alpha beta and by extension all neurexins are functional scaffolds that are composed of domains mediating distinct cell type specific functions and often I speculate without having the evidence for it, these functions are likely to be overlapping. The implications for diseases caused by neurexin mutations, in my view, 
are that it is essential to not only determine whether a mutation is functionally significant, as we showed in the human neurons, but also to identify its action, which may be restricted to one of several functions. And this implication leads me to the next part of my talk, which is studying a neuroligand mutation that has been associated with autism. And this is the final data part of my talk, so, but it's, uh, anyway. Uh, so many mutations in neuroligand 3 have by now been linked to autism. There's multiple point mutations, there's CNVs. The first mutation, actually the first mutation in idiopathic autism discovered at all was a point mutation in neuroligand 3 in R451C. And we made mice that have this mutation, point mutation, because neuroligand 3 is highly conserved in mice, as well as knockout mice, to genotype copy the CNVs. And then we compared their phenotypes. And for many years, we encountered the fundamental problem that most phenotypes that we observed, especially physiologically, but also behaviorally, were completely different. In fact, historically, we first analyzed r 51 c knock in mice, and we found all these phenotypes, and we were very excited and very happy. And then we got the neuroligand 3 knockouts, and they had also been linked to autism in humans, and they had a totally different phenotype, which basically meant that the initial phenotypes that we had for the r 51 c knock in weren't really that informative for the human condition, even though they are biologically interesting. And the reason for this diversity is that the R451C mutation destabilizes neuroligand 3. It's a loss of function, but a little bit neuroligand 3 remains, and that little bit, for an unknown reason, has a gain of function activity that changes many synapses which are not affected by the neuroligand 3 knockout. So in terms of behavioral analyses, we and others have shown that the neural alpha 51 c has improved in behavior in the water maze test, famously called the Morris water maze, yeah. uh, whereas the knockout didn't, doesn't seem to have any phenotype. They have a decreased social approach. The knockout doesn't seem to have a phenotype. But the social memory seems to be impaired by the knockout, but not the alpha 51 c So this um, puzzled us. And I just want to remark here, as an aside, because this is kind of important in using mice as a way to analyze not only biology but also diseases, that obviously no mouse will ever be autistic. And when we try to analyze phenotypes in mice, behavioral phenotypes in particular, we really have to get away from the idea that we're going to basically have an autistic mouse or a mouse that resembles or whatever. What we're only going to have to look for is sort of symptom domains and try to understand how specific uh, types of behaviors may be linked to circuits, even though particular circuit functions in terms of behavior may differ between mice and humans. And so um, we really have to n get away from the notion that we can actually, uh, for example, uh, phenocopy, I think, the exact same social uh, changes in mice that we observe in human patients. In previous analyses before we started these studies, repetitive movements, routines, anything that relates the ability of an organism, of a mouse, to actually do the same thing over and over again had not been studied. But we noted in an analysis of the literature that several autism-associated mutations in mice resulted in mice that actually performed better on a repetitive motor learning task, the rotor rod assay. And common example are Nurexin-1 mutant mice that we described and 15Q11-113 duplications um, that also show this phenotype. And the assay here is very simple, although the interpretation of the assay is indeed complex. This assay consists of putting a mouse onto a rotating rod and you accelerate the rod, and then you measure in multiple trials per day how fast, how long the mouse can stay on there. And 
there's two parameters, crudely speaking. One is the initial ability of the mouse to stay on there, which depends on motivation, of course, and on the initial coordination, and the ability of the mouse to learn to stay on there, which improves from trial to trial. And in our parameter, the way we do this assay is that we do first do two days of trials for four to 40 RPMs, and then we increase this to 8 to 80 RPMs because the mice learn. And that way, it increases the dynamic range. And this is a typical example of data from R451C mice, where we and others had shown that the mice learn better, as you can see, compared to the wild-type littermate controls. And you can analyze this by putting a line through this data that gives you the slope. And the slope is the learning curve, and the intersection with the y-axis is the initial coordination. And so you get two parameters, initial coordination and learning curve. And you can see the initial coordination is the same in the mutants, and the learning curve rate is dramatically enhanced in the alpha 5 c Now, the important thing was that the neuroligon 3 knockout had exactly the same phenotype as the point mutation. And so this suggested that this particular phenotype, behavioral phenotype, could be used as a sedgeway or as an entry point to try to understand more about what these mutations may have in common that reflects a repetitive learning, motor learning behavior. And so we wanted to analyze how this actually works. But in order to analyze this, we first had to establish that this really is a kind of stereotype behavior, because no mouse behavior is ever something that indicates one thing. And uh, uh, this one certainly doesn't. So to at least look at how these mice, why these mice learn better, uh, Patrick, who did these experiments, videotaped the mice as they were learning on the rod. And then he measured three parameters with their footsteps on on this rotating rod. He measured the st step location, the step length, and the step timing. And what he specifically measured is how reproducible these mice were, how stereotypic these mice were in putting the feet exactly the same place. And what you can see here is that comparing trial 7 with 12, the step location became much more reproducible in the knockouts, but not in the wild type, as did the step length. And there was a term for the step timing, even though it was not statistically significant because the wild type had this great variation. And so indeed, these mice presumably are better learners to stay on this rod because they are able to better learn how to exactly do it always the same and thereby keep from falling. Um, however, not all other sort of repetitive behaviors that are in the literature were impaired. For example, grooming is perfectly normal in these mice. So by no means this is, uh, they, have all, they have all kinds of repetitive behaviors. This is the behavior that was the key for our analysis. So um, in addition to this rotorot behavior, the other thing I should mention is that also these two mice were hyperactive, which is a general, somewhat nonspecific uh, effect of many mutations. So what we have then is a gene and a molecule, neuroligon 3. And what we also have is a behavior. And what we would like to do is find out how these two are connected. And in order to do that, we used conditional knockouts. We created conditional knockouts using standard mouse genetics. And then we asked whether deletions of neuroligon 3 in either the cerebellum or the striatum might phenocopy the knockout or the point mutation. And we chose these two brain regions for obvious reasons. The cerebellum has been implicated in motor learning for decades, as has been the striatum, right? So, and when we did this for the cerebellum using l 7 q that is selectively expressed in Purkinje cells throughout the cerebellum, the only output neuron of the cerebellum, we found that the phenotype of the mice, that the mice had no phenotype in the rotor rod learning, even though they were hyperactive. So there was a phenotype, but they had no phenotype in rotor rod learning. So that, was, didn't, that wasn't there. What about the striatum? 
And you've heard already from Bernardo that the stratum contains two principal types of projection neurons, D1 and D2 MSNs, that can be genetically manipulated separately. So we first manipulated D1 neurons, and when we manipulated D1 neurons, we reproduced the phenotype completely, as you can see here. They learned better on the rotor rod, and they were hyperactive. So manipulating the D1 neurons, new, de deleting neural ligand 3 from D1 neurons fully rep recapitulated the phenotype. However, when we did the same thing for D2 neurons with an A2A Cree, because it's more specific than a D2 Cree, there was no phenotype. So this localizes an essential function for neoligon 3 in this phenotype, increased rotor rod learning, to one particular type of neuron in one particular brain region. However, the brain region, the nucleus striatum, the striatum is incredibly large. It's huge. And it is traditionally divided into a ventral nucleus accumbens and the dorsal striatum in addition to a shell and core. Um, so we wondered whether it's the ventral or the dorsal striatum that's involved. We also wondered whether the phenotype can be produced by deleting neuroligon 3 in adult. And so to ask these two questions, we injected AAVs encoding CRE or control into either the nucleus accumbens or the dorsal striatum, and then measured the phenotype. And we found that the phenotype was reproduced when we injected it in the nucleus accumbens. So the ventral striatum, neuroligon 3, was essential for this phenotype, this particular phenotype, which was somewhat surprising given the role of the nucleus accumbens in reward behaviors. The dorsal striatum, however, was completely, un uh, injections of neuroligon 3 deleting Cre viruses into the dorsal striatum, however, created no phenotype, it was nothing, which was even more surprising because the dorsal striatum is indeed, obviously, essential for motor behaviors normally. Yeah. So, these experiments thus established that the nucleus accumbens is selectively involved and the dorsal striatum is not for this particular phenotype, only for this neuroligon 3. Okay. And given this situation, we were interested whether this is a reward-related behavior. So um, uh, Patrick recently performed uh, cocaine condition place preference experiments where you basically measure whether the animal will learn to like cocaine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the bottom line is there was no phenotype. The mice were equally mutant and wild type. Litter mates were equally uh, hyperactive after, after giving them to cocaine, so they got excited, and they had the same, same place preference. So at least in this admittedly crude measure of reward, there was no phenotype. So it's at least not an overall reward kind of thing. It's truly a specific phenotype. Is this a developmental phenotype? This is a particularly important question if you consider autism as a disorder, but I think it's also functionally an interesting question. And the fact that we can reproduce the phenotype by deleting new ligand 3 from adult nucleus accumbens suggests that it is not. Moreover, we were able to conditionally rescue the neuroligon 3 mutation that was introduced during development by reintroducing neuroligon 3 in the adult nucleus accumbens, as shown in this experiment, where we use D1 Cre mice that had been crossed with neuroligon 3 conditional mice and then injected uh, double floxed neuroligon 3 into the nucleus accumbens. And when we did this, we fully rescued the phenotype. So it's reversible. It's not a developmental phenotype. It's fully reversible. It's the actual function of the molecule in the adult that mediates the, the phenotype. So what I've told you then is that neuroligon 3 loss of function enhances repetitive motor learning performance via a specific brain region, cell type, D1 MSNs, and that this is a function or dysfunction. I don't know whether you call it a dysfunction if the mouse does something better, but anyway. Um, uh, it's not a developmental phenotype. 
it can be reversed in adults. And so the obvious uh, question is, well, is this a synaptic impairment? We expected that it might be due to an ex excitatory synapse, because excitatory synapse is predominant in the, predominate within the striatum due to the inputs from the uh, cortex and thalamus, and also because it has been reported that DHPG-mediated LTD is changed in neuroligand 3 knockout mice in the cerebellum. But we found no synaptic phenotype. In fact, we didn't find it in the cerebellum either. In our hands, there's no phenotype in the cerebellum and DHPG mediated suppression either. <coughs> There's just no phenotype in that particular paradigm. There was nothing that we measured in excitatory synaptic transmission that was impaired. We then measured inhibitory synaptic transmission and observed a decrease in D1 MSNs in the mini frequency, but not in D2 MSNs and not in the amplitude, a selective decrease in the mini frequency of the D1 MSNs, which thus correlates with the phenotype, especially since we only observed it in the nucleus accumbens, but not in the dorsal striatum, and observed it both in the knockout and in the knock-in. And so this led to the model that there is a change in inhibition that results in a change in excitatory inhibitory balance. And to actually analyze this, Patrick, who did most of these experiments together with Mark Puccillo, analyzed the ratio of excitatory inhibitory strength onto a neuron in the same neuron, and um, as shown here, and found that there was a dramatic decrease in the inhibition excitation ratio. In other words, there was truly a shift in the synaptic input as measured in slices with exercise stimulation end and end. Uh, there was no such change in the absence uh, of um, uh, in the D1 uh, minus neurons of the nucleus accumbens that are presumably D2 neurons. So, um, so this <coughs> led us to the model shown here, whereby a decrease in inhibition leads to a change in excitation inhibition that then leads to this very specific phenotype and. Uh, that just sounds too simple. And I don't have any other explanation, but I still think that this is a, is a simplification because the same neurons presumably participate in multiple circuits, but only this one particular behavior, that, as far as we can tell, was changed. Nevertheless, because it sounded so simple, um, we felt that we needed to test this by yet another approach and this approach was to simply tone down excitability of D2 neurons, or D1 neurons for that matter, using potassium channel. And when you do this, as shown here, when you express this potassium channel, you basically suppress action potential generation, as, as seen here, as a function of current injection, because you increase potassium currents. And when we did this, we found that this reproduce the phenotype if we did this in D1 crease, increased rotor rod learning, hyperactivity, and it created the opposite phenotype if we did this uh, in, in D2 uh, neurons. Um, and um, in, 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 very, uh, in very, uh, what this shows is only the D1 neurons. Um, so, um, so this seems to confirm the notion that, uh, that you can at least phenocopy the behavioral uh, phenotype by changing the inhibition excitation ratio in D1 or D2. And this is summarized in this model slide, um, which basically suggests that in the wild type, you have a balance. And whenever you tip the balance, you get a change in hyperactivity, you, or uh, you get a change in spontaneous activity and in rotor rod learning uh, capacity. Um, the summary here is that both global neuroligand 3 knockouts and neuroligand 3 alpha 5 c mutations and cause enhanced repetitive rotor rod learning via decreased in synaptic inhibition on D1 MSNs in the nucleus accumbens, 
The nucleus accumbens controls repetitive behaviors, whereas dorsostoidin is essential for motor coordination, which I haven't shown. And behavioral and phenotype is not developmentally restricted. The way how to explain this in terms of circuits, I think, will be more complex than this appears to be, because all of the physiology is done in slices. And that is the crucial point that we always have to remember. And so it would actually be wonderful to motivate somebody to do in vivo recordings in the same mice, which I won't do. OK. Just defining, I'm almost done. OK, I'm sorry. Just defining neuronal connections and elucidating the requirements for a given class of neuron uh, for behavior does not explain that behavior. So um, one last slide. Identifying the mechanisms by which specific mutations cause particular disorders will take many billions of dollars. OK, there's no question. Trillions, I think. Because it requires an understanding of the genes involved. I think this is a solvable challenge, but it can't be done without sort of understanding how the few number of genes can create this beautiful complexity that is the brain. And I would like to illustrate this in my final slide with this cover from The New Yorker, which demonstrates children performing a performance and all the parents, and each parent <coughs> films only one little, yeah. <laughs> and I thought that that was a, a very nice way of looking at this, because you can then ask, would it be possible to reconstruct the play if you had these various movie clips, but not the whole thing? And you could also rephrase this question, or change it a little bit, and say, if one actor was missing, but all the other actors were doing the same thing, and we, only, we knew the audience's reaction, would it be possible to understand what is missing without understanding the whole play? And I think that this sort of gets at where we are in terms of trying to understand the effect of gene mutations in disorders such as autism. Finally, let me acknowledge the people who are most responsible for the work I discussed today. Jason Aoto did all the Neurexin 3 work. Chang Hee Pak did the Neurexin 1 human cell work with Ying Sha Zhang's help. Wei Shu did the initial studies on, on uh, memory precision. Um, so I'm trying to help with the IN cells. And Patrick Rothwell and Mark Fucillo uh, were a formidable team in analyzing both neurexin gene expression on the one hand and the neuroligand 3 mutations on the other hand. I have had wonderful collaborators at Stanford, in particular Marius Wernick, my colleague upstairs, Rob Malenka, my colleagues next door, and Axel Brunger, who is in the next building. And I am indebted, especially to NIMH and HHMI, for funding. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so the interesting thing about the human genetics is that it identified mutations actually in multiple points in this whole interaction pathway. So presynaptic neurexins, postsynaptic neuroligans, postsynaptic scaffolding molecules, syngap we heard about, um, uh, shanks, and so on. So it's almost like many, any kind of interference with the pathway can lead to uh, abnormalities. Specific behavior phenotype. So, for example, the 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 disinhibition of the D1 neurons and nuclear accumbens 
That you would imagine will lead to many behavior deficit, but the, the mice. Yeah, so, yeah, you're getting exactly at the point that I find, in fact, the most interesting in the study, which is the discrepancy between behavioral specificity and apparent sort of physiological change. And the only way I can hypothesize an explanation, the only hypothesis I can think of to explain this, is that neurons will be parts of many overlapping circuits. And depending on which inputs are activated and what patterns, these circuits are activated behaviorally and implicate behaviors. And when we measure it by physiology, we don't make those differentiations. And so my explanation for this is that the nucleus accumbens D1 neurons are, of course, they're essential for reward behaviors. But this particular change doesn't affect it because that affects one subset of inhibitor neurons that are maybe not involved in reward behaviors. They may be involved just in something else. Like. Uh, postsynaptically, uh, uh, postnatally, but I think also one. Postsynaptically. <laughs> <laughs> what, but one way to think about this is those circuits are actually there under the disease conditions. Somehow, for example, this particular behavior artificially <coughs> activates, um, say, dumping particular dopamine into uh, nuclear accumbens. And I'm just thinking about what uh, Bernardo's system um, showing this mor morning, maybe uh, whether you can measure this different behavior uh, manipulation sort of experience dependent synaptic uh, rewiring into the nuclear accumbens that might explain this uh, specificity. Yeah. Fact is you can rescue it. We'll have to rewire quickly. <laughs> 